Welcome everybody, wherever you are this afternoon, to the seventh edition of our digital lecture series, Fight Every Crisis, Global Perspectives of a Post-Corona Economy. On behalf of the Cusanos University and our cooperation partner for this lecture, the Campus Mumbai of the Right Livelihood College and the Right Livelihood Foundation. I welcome you all to today's session. The Right Livelihood Foundation is most known for its award, which was established in 1980 to honor and support courageous people solving global problems. And it has become widely known as the Alternative Nobel Prize. My name is Benjamin. I am the facilitator of this series. And it's my pleasure to welcome and introduce to you Professor Dr. Swati Banyarji. She is the chairperson at the Center for Livelihoods and Social Innovation at the Tata Institute of Social Sciences, Mumbai. She's also the coordinator of the Right Livelihood College, one of nine such colleges around the globe. She has been a postdoctoral fellow at Lund University in Sweden and visiting faculty at many universities across the world. She has been heavily involved in research studies at both national and, and international level. Gender, intersectionalities, diversities and marginalities, as well as feminist and post-development theory are key frames for her research. Her thematic focus includes people-centered development and social innovation, human-centered and inclusive design thinking for addressing key societal challenges of marginalities, also collective social entrepreneurship and grassroots entrepreneurship development, as well as empowerment of women in marginalized communities. She has published and is presented extensively on these topics. Uh, let me just point out two recently published books that uh, Professor Swati Banyarji has co-edited. The first one, A Theory of Social Enterprise and Pluralism, and the second book, People-Centered Social Innovation, an emerging paradigm with global potential. Her lecture today refers exactly to the latter. Uh, it is entitled People-Centered Social Innovation and Emerging Paradigm. So Professor Swati Banyarji, thank you so much for making this possible today. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Benjamin. Uh, that was a very beautiful uh, introduction and a lot of kind words. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and thank you, Benjamin, Valentin, Alex, uh, uh, and all of you. Uh, I think this is uh, such a wonderful concept yes, of this uh, lecture series, um, essentially also because you are looking at knowledges across the global south and the global north. And, uh, you know, coming from Mumbai, I think, uh, though we are in a virtual platform, but we are across geographies. Uh, so we are trying to, I think, cut across geographies and trying to look at collective knowledges, knowledges which is diverse, knowledges which is plural, uh, which perhaps uh, post-development theorists like Bubenchira de Souza would call as ecologies of knowledges. Uh, so in the beginning, I would like to thank you for such a wonderful concept of creating the space for interaction and co-creation of knowledges. Uh, so thank you so much. So let me come back to the topic and uh, we are trying to talk about uh, people-centered social innovation. Uh, so essentially what I'll do is I'll try to unpack and see whether uh, that could be an alternative paradigm, whether that could be a way forward, because often it's said that for change to be meaningful, something meaningful has to change the way we approach the world, we approach the reality. Because today we are, as we all know, in difficult circumstances. Today we are at a historical crossroad, if we can say so, where we are caught, what development theorists would say as development deadlock. We are not able to look at our past, which often speaks of multiple inequities. So poverty is not new. Environmental destruction is not new. Gender violence is not new. Lopsided development is not new. So there are multiple inequities in the past, which has often been invisibilized, often been normalized, and the future also seems uncertain. Uh, so, but that definitely means that if we can't look at the past and the future is uncertain, the tomorrow is here, the tomorrow is now. And now is the time to change the narrative. 
and can people-centered social innovation be one of the alternative paradigms to change that narrative? I'll again come back to Bhuvanchura de Souza, uh, the post-development theorist who says, there is another concept, there is another knowledge. How do we analyze and understand this alternative knowledge, this alternative voice? Uh, talking about this alternative knowledge, alternative voice, I'll narrate a story here for you to explain and unpack this concept. This is the story of an old tribal woman uh, who stays in uh, the state of Maharashtra, uh, closer to the city of Mumbai, in a remote tribal village. Now, uh, this, uh, you know, the people in this tribal hamlet were often told as that they are uh, destroying their forest. Uh, so these people, along with a few non-governmental organizations, got together and decided to go to Mumbai to meet the officials to demand for their right to the forest and their human rights. As part of the delegation, this old woman also joined and she came to the city of Mumbai for the first time. Not only first time to the city of Mumbai, but first time she came out of her hamlet. And uh, when she reached this uh, you know, government office, uh, she was overwhelmed and she saw wooden furnitures all around. And she tried to touch and feel the uh, tables which were made of wood, the uh, furnitures were made of wood, the cupboard which was made of wood, and she kept quiet. And then, uh, you know, the, this delegation was kept waiting for a long time as usual by the government official. Finally, when their turn came and they went into his office, the first reaction of the government official to this tribal community is essentially there's a lot of othering um, and uh, they think that the tribal communities, uh, you know, they can't think properly, they are not knowledgeable, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So this government official started shouting at this delegation, said, why are you here again? You are destroying your forest, you are the thieves, and you are here again. Uh, and this old woman could not keep silent any longer, and she almost blurted out spontaneously. She said, uh, you are right. Even I was thinking, where is our forest disappearing? Where are our trees going? Because for you, forest can be a resource. For you, forest can be the source of timber. For you, forest can be the source of wood. But for us, forest is our mother. Forest is our life. Forest is our livelihoods. Forest is our survival. So even I was wondering where our trees are disappearing. But today when I came to your office, I realized our trees are actually disappearing from our forest to your offices. And this, this is the analysis. This is the analysis of a so-called illiterate old tribal woman staying far away from the city. Uh, and this is the voice that Bhuvanchura de Souza says uh, is the new emergence, not in an exotic sense, not in a romantic sense, but this is about new knowledge this is about people's knowledge. This is about people's voices. This is about new happenings and what post-development theorist calls as sociology of emergences. So while we are caught in this development deadlock, and on the other hand, there are these people's voices, which can perhaps analyze better than us the realities. Can we understand these voices of the actors and try to look at a pathway of change. What is that pathway of change? What is the way out? How do we reimagine change? How do we reimagine solidarities? And how do we reimagine transformative action? And you have been discussing this over this lecture series, but perhaps there are no easy answers. So I will attempt to again talk about this people-centeredness in this pathway of change called people-centered social innovation. And let's see if it can offer an alternative paradigm and what are the potential and what are the challenges to be able to transform the marginalities of people and marginalized communities. So now I'll come to uh, another story, uh, a story from my fieldwork to explain 
uh, the understanding of actor centeredness people centeredness in this pathway of change called people centered social innovation um, you know i was uh, in the field uh, trying to do uh, trying to use a participatory methodology to understand the skill sets to map the skill sets of rural women uh, in india you know in the state of maharashtra and while i was sitting with this group of women uh trying to use participatory methodologies uh the first thing was trying to understand the different skill sets that this woman have um and i asked them okay what are the skills that you have and their first immediate and spontaneous reaction was uh but we don't have any skills so that was an internalization of our historicity of understanding that we are not equal we are not worth uh anything uh so then we went on to say okay do you know cooking yes uh do you go to the field and work in the field and do farming yes uh do you make pickles yes and there was a whole long list of the different skill sets that the women have so this was the first level of conscientization for them to understand yes we know a lot of things we have different skill sets once those mapping of skill sets was done to probe a little further uh we tried to understand what is the knowledge that they have in each of this the knowledge experience and their aspiration to do something to start a micro enterprise within any of the skill sets that they have and they identified goatry as uh, something in which they gave themselves a 10 if you see the slide uh, there are this uh you know different colored shells there and uh, instead of giving a number they had put those 10 shells there to say they have uh you know knowledge so they gave 10 on 10 for knowledge 10 on 10 on experience 10 on 10 on aspiration that they want to do goatry now to probe this a little further <clears throat> whether is this their real aspiration in the present context or not uh what i did was there was a small child sitting next to a woman and i asked her do you want your daughter to also get into goatry and her immediate and spontaneous reaction was of course not i want her to study like you and become a university teacher so that's the aspiration that's the voice that's the hope that's the dream of this people but perhaps those dreams are constrained within structural issues of poverty and other constraints and they're not able to realize it so it's also very very important to not only understand people's context their aspirations their knowledge their hopes but it's also to understand that perhaps their agency is restricted within structural inequities and how to understand this unfree agency and perhaps work towards looking at free agency so it's often said minds on the margins are therefore not marginal minds and we need to look at our skills our attitude our knowledge to be able to understand those voices when we are talking about people centered pathway of change or people centered social innovation uh, so it's also about uh, people centered social innovation is also about people led solutions for sustainability which responds to the local context and addresses the contemporary societal concerns um so i would like to uh, talk a little bit about that there are uh, different kinds of pathways uh, in terms of a perspective and a change process when we are talking about uh, social innovation or people centered uh, social innovation which is about both a concept and strategy to address the societal challenges could be immediate societal needs could be larger uh, structural changes uh, so one of it is the grassroots innovation which is about uh, you know a uh, practice change process within a uh, micro context of the communities where people come together identify their problem and try to look at a process of change <clears throat> it is more uh, bottom up at the same time there are constraints in terms of 
finances and sustainability often. We come to the next, which is about design innovation, which is more uh, top down, which is about trying to address the gaps of services and projects. You see a picture here. Uh, so it's a, a social innovation designer who has designed uh, a low cost bag, which can also be converted into a table for children from low income neighborhoods in slums in India. Uh, we also have uh, number four, which is about uh, trying to address the larger societal challenges like poverty, like illiteracy <coughs> through social innovation. And there are, <coughs> sorry, and there are various programs in India trying to address this. For example, National Rural Livelihood Mission. Uh, and there is therefore a scope for looking at innovation within the policy framework. And finally, uh, you know, you see number three is structural innovation, which is trying to look at the larger structural inequities, uh, the strategic needs, for example, uh, movements trying to address, for example, you have the uh, Black Lives Matter movement uh, in the US, uh, you have the environmental movements, we have the Dalit right movements in India, and this are trying to address the systemic problems, the larger structural issues, and therefore there are these different pathways of change when we are talking about social innovation. Now to uh, explain this a little further, I'll take you through another example uh, of a story of struggle, survival and solidarities. It's a social enterprise called Dignity and Design, but I'll take you through that pathway to see to say that, uh, you know, how do we move towards that pathway of change from understanding the local context to identifying and prioritizing people's needs to find an innovation solution and to bring about a change which looks at social value creation. So this is uh, the story of uh, manual, uh, what is called manual scavengers in India. Now, who are the manual scavengers or who were the manual scavengers? Uh, they are uh, people who were cleaning human waste. And that's an extremely, extremely uh, discriminatory uh, practice. But I thought I'll take one of this extreme example to say that how it's possible to transform the marginalities or at least move towards that pathway of change. Uh, so, uh, you can see some of the photographs. In fact, I have not chosen some of the other photographs as it's even to see those, it's difficult. So this is uh, the manual scavenging has been a caste and gender based profession in India. So people from a particular uh, caste were forced to do this act of cleaning, extremely discriminatory, stigmatized and they were almost like bonded laborers. They were not even given a regular wage. Uh, they were given some grains. Uh, they were given some bread every day and five INR during festivals. But still they continued to this, do this kind of inhuman, if I may say inhuman work. So this is about, the story is about how people were surviving in an extremely, extremely oppressive context. Uh, within this context, there were some uh, non-governmental organizations, civil society organizations, uh, which tried to mobilize these people to say that what is happening to you is inhuman. This is not accepted. This can't be normalized. We have to get together and we have to resist. And therefore, there was resistance, mobilization, and finally, an act was passed to ban manual scavenging. And in 2013, about 18,000 people were liberated from this inhuman task of manual scavenging. But because of the historicity of exploitation and oppression, they were still socially and economically excluded. They were marginalized. Um, an informal untouchability was continued. Uh, they were not 
they were liberated, but they couldn't get into other sources of livelihoods. So if they would do a food stall, other people would not buy for, from them. So what next? The struggle, but what is next? So there was a new beginning in the form of uh, an initiative called Dignity and Design uh, by an organization called Jansahas and where our students and some of us were also involved to shape this uh, social innovation project or a social enterprise. So the first thing that was done was individually, each of them felt that they ha do not have any worth. So there was a need to collectivize them because there is power in collectivization. There is collective power. So they were community-based institutions which were formed. And then the next big task was to look at capability development and to train them. So this was an enterprise which were into garment making. And the core idea of the enterprise was about not only livelihoods promotion, but it was about dignity of these people. It was about rights. Now, while doing the capability development, one main concern was <coughs> stitching garments or stitching like other women. For this woman, it was they did not knew it. It was not a traditional skill. And they said that they have never touched a sewing machine in, in their whole lives. They've only carried the basket in which they would carry the vest. They would carry the human vest. So it was a major challenge, but the capability development was done. And then the livelihoods promotion project was started. So it was about trying to look at collective power. It was trying to look at people's agency. So people are not just targets of development. They are not beneficiaries of development. They have to be part of the process of development. So there is a need to look at beyond victimhood to understand people's agency. And therefore, it was also about building solidarities, solidarities amongst the people who were affected, and also solidarities amongst the mainstream people to understand that this is a problem. This is a situation of oppression which needs to be changed. And we need to come together to change that oppression to transform those marginalities. This is, uh, I've just brought this because this is one of my uh, favorite picture where I was there in one of the training centers along with the women trying to hear their narratives, trying to understand their narratives and trying to create policy documents to be able to uh, you know, address this issue and uh, start this enterprise. And it was, I would say, a learning experience for me more than the women, uh, because it's their voices which helped me to understand, uh, you know, how are they experiencing this oppression and therefore what could be a way forward. And uh, the organization Jansa has, is an extremely grounded organization trying to bring about this change. Uh, so this is on the, uh, you know, you can see a photograph there, but of course you might not be able to read it. Uh, it's in the local language. Uh, but uh, this is a banner which is put in the uh, Office of Dignity and Design, this new enterprise uh, started by the women. Uh, this banner says that women has taken this oath that they would never touch human vest again. And it's a, it's a, uh, it's signifying empowerment. So what is empowerment? You know, it's, uh, it's also important when we are talking about people-centered innovation that we break down these jargons. So empowerment is a huge word and sometimes depoliticized. It's important to unpack it to understand empowerment is about the ability uh, is about having the agency to take decision. It's about capability development. Uh, it's about uh, collectivization. It's about moving beyond victimhood. It's about conscientization. So how do we understand empowerment in our local context? And therefore, uh, this enterprise was built on the principles of human rights and dignity, that they are equal and 
they are and they are equal and they should not be discriminated based on their caste and gender uh livelihood security is a right it's not a benefit that's given to them either by the civil society by people like us or by the government it's about consciousness raising and mobilization uh it's about community capacity development yeah it's not necessarily just individual capacity development but it's about that collective capacity development and finally uh what is very very important is about deinstitutionalization now what do i mean by deinstitutionalization here so here a caste and gender oppression has been an institution which is oppressing which was oppressing uh, this people historically and even in contemporary times uh so this enterprise this collective of women dignity and design try to deinstitutionalize the oppressive institution of caste and gender and looked at reinstitutionalization where there is expansion of people's agency and where there is empowerment where there is participation uh so it's about and the whole process therefore was about trying to understand the context context of how people are surviving the local context uh creating a conscientization to for people to understand that this is not normal this need not be invisibilized and therefore there was struggle resistance and mobilization and finally the enterprise called dignity and design which is trying to break the caste and gender based oppression and the, therefore the focus is on lived experiences the focus is on collectivization and the focus is on people's agency if we are to break down the understanding of this pathway of change called people centered social innovation therefore uh, coming to some of the key constructs when we say people centered social innovation it's about centering people and it's also about epistemic inclusion so how do we look at citizen participation and how do we look at local practice so there are three key constructs that i would like to highlight at this point taking from the example that i have just narrated it's about one what robert chambers said is trying to understand the micro context because a lot of times things go unobserved and therefore undervalued i'll talk uh, i'll share another quick example here it's about a um, uh, mangrove in india called sundarbans um, and uh, this is um, a place where we say that we need to uh, preserve uh, the environment here because it's getting destroyed etc etc uh, so when i went to sundarbans um, you know uh, i uh, i took up uh, you know i went to some of the uh, villagers along with the local analyst or some of the people in the community and uh, i could see only some of the villagers and meet some of the people who were marginalized but not the most marginalized within that context uh, so i tried to reflect why you know and i tried to ask you know are the tribal people here they said no they are not here they are in more interior hamlets uh so i asked the uh, community people who were accompanying me that uh, you know why are we not going here so they said no we didn't take you there because we thought you won't be able to walk that much travel that much etc etc uh so uh, you know and that could be an outsider bias that we have that other people have <clears throat> so finally i could go to some of the interior uh, hamlets some of the interior villages and i observed uh you know quite a lot of things perhaps which i would have otherwise left out uh so uh when i one went to one of the hamlets and i was sitting with this woman in her house and there was uh, a small canal next to her house and uh, she told me that uh, you know sister uh, there was a tiger the other day uh, just next to the canal and uh, that tiger picked up some buddy uh, she was telling about her relative and how that person died and she was almost normalizing that incident she was telling it in a matter of fact manner i was getting worried i was sitting there and just a few meters away 
she was telling where the tiger came and picked up somebody and it comes regularly and such is the daily struggle of their lives and uh, when i went to some of the other hamlets i realized that some of the hamlets are called widow hamlets if i translate it loosely in english why because most of the men in those hamlets have been engaging in uh, either collecting honey or uh, you know uh, doing fisheries and they have been killed either by a tiger or a crocodile and uh, in spite of those realities those struggles for survival people are still staying in those contexts so these are questions for us perhaps there are no immediate answers that why do people still stay in those contexts so therefore it's important to understand the micro context and see that it is observed and it is valued in our research in our practice in our understanding the second construct of people centered social innovation i would say is about the lived experiences and the knowledges of people and that is about representing people's voices it's about people's collective agency we have to be very very careful to see that how do we represent people you know are people getting empowered or are we doing our own research and these are i think continuous reflections and dilemmas that we all face and the third participation of people in the change process or the social innovation process uh, how do we look at people's engagement and how do how we should not depoliticize people's engagement uh, it's important to understand therefore this relation between uh, social economic and political and trying to understand how each relates to the other and act on the same here i'll try to bring in <coughs> again uh, what amartya sen has spoken about freedom and unfreedom he talks about unfreedom for example being poverty which does not allow people to access certain assets and therefore does not allow that person or group of people to improve their quality of life and therefore he says that freedom is central to the process of development and that is for two reason evaluative reason and for effectiveness reason now what is evaluative reason he is talking about the process and outcome of that development initiative um, as evaluative reason but the effectiveness reason he is saying that it is about people being able to actively participate in the process of development that will not only lead to an outcome in terms of an instrumental outcome for of development but the outcome is also about the actor and the actor networks and their participation and their empowerment and therefore freedom becomes a core to understanding people's participation in the process of development and that is often neglected in most of our development initiatives uh, perhaps in the global south and maybe also in the global north um so let me come again to another example of empowerment in practice how do we create new democratic spaces at the grassroots uh, how do we look at innovations in methodologies of citizen participation or participation of people uh, so participation is again not a monolithic term it doesn't happen automatically uh, it needs specific knowledge sets <clears throat> it needs specific pedagogies to be able to see that people are participating so i'll take you through a series of photographs and uh, tell you some of the processes of participatory methodologies uh, and maybe uh, you know later give some references if you want to get more in depth into it uh, so we uh, you know uh, this we do this exercise in rural areas along with civil society organizations sometime along with government to help them understand how do you incorporate people's participation in the process of planning and change uh, this is one such photograph now i'll take you through some of the steps uh, so phase 
and this phase can be skipped when you are already working on the ground but this phase one is largely for our students uh, to understand you know how they should understand this participatory methodologies and knowledge it needs a lot of practice before they are able to actually go into the field and practice it the phase two is about being in the communities in this case the example is of our village but it could be done in any context so uh, it's about getting into the village and once we are into the village we don't uh, start with our tools straight away we build rapport with the people we talk to the community members the community leaders before we can start the process of participation incorporating people's participation through participatory tools we do first what is called a transact walk and the transact walk is not only just a walk in the community but it's a walk along with the local people for us to get familiarized with the different uh, places and spaces in the community which later helps in triangulation of data and it's always said that when we are doing a transact walk it's important that we stop at different places and try and understand what people are showing to us what people are saying to us and that uh, doesn't necessarily help people it helps us so the field work and being in the field and understanding people's voices is a very very uh, is an example in humility for us as researchers for us as practitioners for us as development uh, practitioners uh, so it's it's a very humbling space uh, where we realize that uh, people know better about their context than us and we need to learn from them and i think that's one of the first things the researchers unlearning the practitioners unlearning that happens um, we also interact a lot with the children when we do participatory exercises because children are uh, come uh, you know it's easy to build rapport with children and uh, we do a lot of exercises uh, it also builds curiosity amongst the community when children are coming and uh, they are engaging with us and then what we do is to uh, take the curiosity further usually in a micro level planning exercise we also do a torch walk in the evening after our transact walk along with the children and uh, it it gives visibility it creates curiosity and while we are doing this we also tell why we are here in the village what are we planning to do and we also ask them the next day to come to a common place where we can start doing some of the things together um this is a social mapping exercise in the village where people are identifying people are creating the map of their village map of their community and identifying uh, the different infrastructure place where they stay very very interesting things come out in this uh, you know at one point in time we realized that when we were doing the social mapping exercise it's largely uh, the men who were there so we tried to introspect is it that it's not interesting to the others uh, what is the reality and then we realized that the time we were having the social mapping exercise that was the time that the women have to do the household chores they have to do the cooking and therefore as we realized our fault that as development practitioners we need to understand the community's clock and do things accordingly if we are to look at participation of everybody participation is not a monolithic word there are diversities there are diversities which emerges out of the power equations power hierarchies and therefore we need to rework reinvent our strategies if we are to look at participation of people uh, we also do a lot of creative things like street theaters etc to get people together uh, before we are able to do some of this participatory exercises uh, so this is the map being done again uh this is uh, an interesting tool where uh you know there are different sizes 
of card boards where people are saying what are the different institutions they have in the village, like a self-help group, um, a health uh, health post, um, you know, uh, uh, the different other things, a post office, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And these sizes reflect whether it's important for them, it's not important for them, etc. And uh, whether uh, you know it's they are able to benefit from these institutions, not able to benefit from these institutions. It also leads to very interesting discussions. Uh, for example, I uh, remember we were doing a daily activity schedule for men and women in the village. Uh, so when we asked the men, what are the different things that they do? They said they do one, two, three, four. Uh, we asked the men, what are the things that women do? And they hardly knew anything about it. They said, no, the women don't do much. So then we did the same exercise with women separately. And women said they do one, two, three, four, five, six. And the men don't do actually much. And then we got this two together and showed it to both men and women. And that led to a lot of discussion and understanding of what are the different roles and responsibilities of men and women in the village. And how, uh, you know, there is a lot of work productive and reproductive work that the women and community work that the women are doing that is neglected that's not understood both by men and women so it's also leads to a process of conscientization and that we say is the first step towards empowerment uh, and one of the very very important things when we do this exercise is visual uh, how do we simplify things and start with uh, you know a photograph uh, pebbles, local materials, which people could use. And then we start off the discussion. Uh, the phase three, which is very important after we have finished this exercise uh, in the village, which could span a few days, which could also span more number of days, uh, is about dissemination of information in the community itself. So we do a community dissemination uh, and we tell what is the result that we have got and people iterate people say you have done this correct you have not done this correct etc etc and uh, in one of this community events i remember the head person of the village uh, said that oh uh, we didn't knew that the enrollment rate of uh, girls uh, in our village is more than the boys uh, you know that's a wonderful um, you know uh, finding that you have got and now we are more encouraged to focus on girls' education. Uh, so, you know, some of these things are very interesting. The how we look at uh, not only an understanding of issues to local participation, but also the next stage is about planning, people taking responsibilities for their own plan. And of course, then connecting it to uh, the government to look at scaling of those plans. And finally, a debriefing at the Institute as well, because it's also about data and analyzing that data uh, to say that this is not just about, uh, you know, community participation, but data emerging out of that community participation, which is legitimate data. And that has to be incorporated in our development planning. There is a very interesting book by Robert Chambers called Revolutions in Development Enquiry, which is trying to say how do we look at participation of people and how do we also legitimize those participatory practices in our academia, in development practice, and in the policy framework and in development planning. <clears throat> so uh, the commitment, fun, and fulfillment of uh, participatory processes is a continuous process for change and transformation. It's also a lot of fun if there is commitment. It's not easy. You know, some of these processes when we do, it's about walking long distances along with people. Uh, sometimes it's very hot. Uh, so, uh, you know, the travel, uh, you know, sometimes we don't have enough food while we are traveling because there are no spaces to buy food etc etc uh, but if we are committed i think there is a lot of excitement and it needs passion and then it becomes a joyful experience for life uh, so the process in brief is about uh, having this visual showing 
a picture, having a table, <coughs> starting off from this uh, visual exercise to facilitating a discussion amongst people uh, through different participatory tools and techniques, and then enabling people <coughs> to discover their views by simplifying the information and then, of course, analyzing that information. Um, now I'll get into uh, some of the key constructs that emerges from some of these processes of social innovation and the different experiences and experiments uh, that are part, that we have been part of and are there. Um, how do we differentiate between the rhetoric and reality, as Robert Chambers says? Um, who participates? Uh, what institutions are involved? <laughs> what objective local participation has? Uh, and some of these are questions uh, not necessarily to be answered immediately, but to be continuously kept in our mind while we are engaging with processes of change, either in academia or in practice, and how do we move between imaginary and reality to center people in practice. And these are questions which are very, very, very important uh, to remember. Um, now, participation, as I said, uh, you know, can also lead to exclusion if that participation is not done well. Uh, for example, a quick example here is uh, in a village in Africa, a group of uh, <clears throat> uh, men goes to uh, understand what are the hardships of in the village or try to do an assessment exercise in the village. And they realize that it's adolescent men uh, who are the most marginalized. The team leader says, <coughs> they, that they have got it wrong, essentially because the bias was that maybe it, the women would be the most marginalized. So it's also important that uh, our community action plans uh, does not become the plans of the powerful minority. We understand the diversities in the communities and therefore who are the people who are the most marginalized, most impacted. And there is a need to recognize the multiple realities and prioritize the realities of the poor and the disadvantaged. And I'm continuously reiterating this because this is one of the most, most important construct when we are talking about people-centeredness, people-centeredness in development, people-centeredness in innovation. Um, participatory approaches also often gets depoliticized and uh, Williams talk about how do we need to repoliticize that. So it should not stay as jargon. You know, it's important that we unpack what is empowerment and how does empowerment play out in practice for uh, people to move towards that pathway of change for people's agency to get expanded. Uh, so now to quickly summarize the key constructs that I have said, and some of the literature that exists around this. So uh, one of the first thing is about inclusion. Who are the people who are participating? Again, trying to answer that question. That there are power hierarchies when we are talking about people. It could be men, women, higher caste, lower caste, uh, so-called higher caste, lower caste within the context of India. It could be race. It could be ethnicity, et cetera, et cetera. How do we understand this diversity, identity, the politics of difference, the context of local space, and look at a process which is trying to include people within a context which could be of exclusion? Uh, there are various uh, you know, the, uh, references around it, which is about uh, which is by Andrea Conwell, by Escobar, etc. I was talking about beyond coloniality and how we look at also pluralism in knowledge. Uh, the second construct that I've said, which is very important, is people's participation and how do we understand what is representation of people and what is engagement. These are the two key, very important constructs which we need to keep in mind. And finally, what would be that process of empowerment? How do we identify social value? And again, I'm reiterating here, there's a need to 
uh, repoliticize empowerment because power is an intrinsic word and construct within the idea of empowerment. Otherwise, if we don't understand this, empowerment just becomes another jargon and doesn't help people to expand their agency and actually become empowered. Uh, so there are potential and challenges in this understanding. It's not to say that uh, it's a solution, it's a panacea for all kinds of problems. Uh, the idea is that to understand it as an alternative space, as a different paradigm, and to get into a dialogue, to discover and rediscover our strategies, and to understand both the traps and the liberations, the challenges and the potential that are part of it. So there are new ideas and old ideas. And, uh, and of course, uh, it's important, therefore, to understand uh, what is, as Robert Chambers says, pro-poor professionalism. And he talks about direct engagement, direct learning from people, and of course, a passion for a better world. And I think that's, that's the most important thing. And when we are talking about this passion for a better world, I'll end it with this other example uh, that uh, I have been very closely involved in and part of a team which have initiated this process. Um, so uh, this is a social enterprise in the slums in Mumbai called Uran uh, for dignified livelihoods of marginalized women in Mumbai slums. You see a picture uh, that's, uh, that's a slum which is located next to the dumping ground in Mumbai uh, in Devnar, which is one of the biggest dumping ground uh, in the city. So they are, uh, they stay in extremely difficult conditions, very poor quality of life, are into informal work and extreme livelihood insecurities. Uh, so after a lot of engagement with them, we realized that we collectivized them into self-help groups and we realized that one of their important need is to look at livelihood security uh, so we started this um, enterprise called Uran and uh, we tried to build their capacity and today uh, they are experts in making laptop bags and you can see one of these pictures here. And uh, this laptop bags are not only being sold internally, but we have uh, sent out this laptop bags to many of the right livelihood colleges uh, for their conferences and other programs. And this has uh, actually created a lot of enthusiasm amongst the women. But, uh, you know, uh, while we were moving into this trajectory of slowly building capacities of people and trying to see what can be done, uh, we got into uh, this pandemic and lockdown. And during the pandemic, all production stopped. Uh, they lost the women and the families lost whatever jobs they had. Um, we had lots of phone calls uh, where people said that uh, they don't have anything to eat. There are no food grains, etc., etc. So our strategy changed. Uh, we worked with a group of very, very committed students. And uh, so then we uh, coordinated with other non-governmental organizations. We did some fundraising. And uh, our effort was to see that we reach out to people in terms of uh, giving them food grains, trying to arrange for their essential medicines, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, you know, recently, uh, sometime back, when one of the women called me, uh, her voice was so low. Usually, she is one of those enthusiastic women. And she almost said that we don't know whether we'll be able to get back into the production again. So, uh, you know, we were also wondering what to do. And very recently, just a few weeks back, again, uh, you know, with the lockdown being uh, relaxed a little, we again got back and people have started uh, another cycle of production. And one of the women said uh, that, you know, we, uh, you know, there have been many, many problems, but we don't want to stop this process that we have started. Uh, you know, our, uh, one, this gives us a sense of belonging. Uh, this gives us a sense of collective. 
uh, and also our bags has gone up to Germany. That it went to our bags had gone to Right Livelihood College Bonn, uh, and they said if it has gone there and if people have appreciated, um, you know, uh, we don't want to stop this now. In spite of all our struggles, we want to get back to it because it's also about uh, dignity and empowerment. Now, so that was. Uh, you know, uh, very motivating for us as well. And we started the next cycle of production and we are planning to uh, sell some internally. And we are also, uh, some of our students are coordinating with Right Livelihood College in Santa Cruz and are planning to sell it through their campus as well. Uh, so we are trying to create, I think this is what I would call uh, local practices and global solidarities. Uh, so the need of the R you know, within the pandemic is about this global knowledge, local practices, understanding people's voices, creating this global solidarity and global knowledge. And I think all of us are part of it, you and me. And I think together we can change this world. We can talk about lots of jargons, empowerment, participation, um, et cetera, et cetera. But what is important is that commitment is that passion for change, as I said, that passion for a fairer world and for change to happen, you know, something has to change the way we approach the world. And therefore, I'll come with, come to my last uh, slide, which is talking about, therefore, do we need development alternatives or alternatives to development itself? Do we need a complete shift in paradigm and it needs interrogation. And therefore, uh, perhaps what you can also do is think of what are the key words that are coming to your mind when we are talking about reimagining uh, our paradigm of social change or uh, re looking or re looking at this paradigm of social innovation or people centered social innovation. So I would like to read this out. Uh, and wind up with this, that sometimes a voice becomes a simple commitment, just a simple commitment that everyone is heard. And I will like to quickly again narrate an example here. Uh, when again, I was in one of the villages and doing this participatory exercise, uh, the woman there was so happy just because you know, I was in her house, I was sharing a cup of tea with her and talking to her. And she said, nobody has come to our house like this and has shared our feelings, has shared our thoughts. And she also says that most often when the development planners come, uh, you know, they just, uh, you know, come by cars, etc., and they just come and go away. Uh, during election time, sometimes uh, they come, but they don't come to our houses. And she said, if you don't drink tea in our vessel, if you don't eat food in our vessel, how would you know what is the size of our vessel? And that's so interesting, isn't it? That's an analysis. That's about people's participation. That's about people's knowledge. Uh, so sometimes it's a simple commitment that we hear people. And in this sense and above all else, a people-centered social innovation is about a willingness to share expertise, to co-produce understanding, and to work towards social value creation that serves the interest of the most marginalized communities. And I think that would be a new pathway of change in which all of us can participate. And I would end it with a very interesting poem uh, by a revolutionary poet of Pakistan, uh, Faiz Ahmed Faiz, who says, we shall witness, and it's certain that we too shall witness the day that has been promised. I'm sure we will. And with those words, I would end it here and uh, give this references uh, to of my uh, books, which talks about some of those complexities and some of the examples of people-centered social innovation. Uh, so thank you so much. I think uh, with those words, I will stop here. And I look forward to hearing from you, your responses, your experiences, and let's co-create this plural knowledge. Thank you again. Thank you so much.